And now uh, I think we can open the uh, broader discussion. Maybe Federico could start. And Stephen, maybe um, you should take over moderating this part. Yeah, of course. Um, so I, I took some notes and I have some question here and there. Maybe I could start with a broad question that is like relevant for different projects and then, and then we can move on. Um, yeah. So let me start because I think I made, uh, yeah, it, it, it started from a thing that Timo said uh, at the beginning uh, on when he was talking about uh, his project and, and the fact that, um, uh, so they found uh, a way of shaping the projects that it could contribute to both disciplines, both the humanities, but also the, the computer science aspect. Uh, and then Timo made this example saying, oh, well, because we show how we, we can build a model or build a tool that could work with a little data or sparse data, which I found a really nice example. Um, usually my issue with this type of uh, solution is that when you present them to a computer science conference or to a journal, the feedback is that, that you need to prove uh, prove that this method is generalizable. So, okay, it works with uh, sparse or little data in this specific historical case study, but what about if you do something similar, but with medical record or what? And then it, like, it forces you to move outside of the digital humanities project where you are working, moving in another, like, or with, an, with other data or with other contexts, simply to prove that your method works in other contexts. So I was wondering more in general, maybe starting with Timo, but then moving in general, how the different team uh, conducted, uh, like, or, or how they organized publications and whether they found ways of publishing in both communities or whether they decided to mostly publish in digital humanities or what was the strategy basically that they, they used? Mm -hmm. Um, so we ended up actually um, publishing in both, right? Um, so uh, we, um, and I mean, you, you mentioned the issue, you have to kind of um, con partially conduct your research accordingly and partially uh, present it accordingly, right? And then presentation, that's actually, um, that's actually a very important issue, but I mean, that applies across the board, right? Um, but yeah, we were successful in, in getting our work published in, in both kinds of venues. Um, which, um, which I'm happy about because, um, well, at the core, I'm a, I'm a CS and, and um, speech person. Um, so this was vital to me. And, and I guess um, it's also how we shaped the, the project that was important, right? So, so it was always the question, um, not only, you know, does it help humanities, but is there also some nice tidbit about it that would be novel? Um, in the on the um, on the CL the CS NLP side, and there it was sparsity of data um, and of highly complex data of human creativity and so on. Um, I, I, I maybe we were just lucky; nobody asked us to to repeat our experiments on on other creative data sets, so to speak. Um, so that may have been luck. Maybe uh, I, I guess the the um, NLP community. Fortunately or unfortunately, is very open uh, to you know, stuff working in just one area, um, and and also luckily we were we were very timely with this. So I guess mm. uh, nowadays it might already be the case that you know um, it's not that novel anymore. Um, so you have to actually be be you know, timely uh, with your research. No, absolutely. I think you made a very good point on novelty and timely because when I was hearing your presentation, I thought that, well, now this is kind of a selling point that everyone in digital humanities working in NLP is trying to, to do. We are also trying to do the same thing in living with machines and the Turing. So it's like every time you have a, a, a new research question, you study how to use it or how to build a model with like small data set. But uh, yeah, your presentation and the topic was like really timely because they, it was like, it was novel uh, in the moment when presenting it. So uh, yeah, for others, feel free to just jump in and if you want to share your, your opinion or your point of view around this. Um, uh, yeah, especially if you have like a different point of view, like uh, let's have like a very open and diverse discussion. Uh, 
Christina? Well, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it, I have a little bit a different point of view because, for example, we were working on this approach in which the, um, <laughs> the human, um, the work of the humanist researcher and the, the construction was the, on the, of the ontology cannot be done uh, with automatic measures and we cannot employ for such things, for example, uh, machine learning, or I don't know what, uh, of these very uh, trendy things. And at this moment, we are in the point of starting to try to pub publish, for example, in uh, publications for reasoning and things, uh, similar things. But up to now, there is a point where you can publish in um, more in the humanities um, publications. But in the, the computer science, it comes immediately to the question, do you use machine learning? <laughs> and I think it's not, it's the point is that you cannot use machine learning just because it's trendy for all types of data and all types of tasks. It, it is, um, I mean, it is a fair point. I mean, for, it is true that for publishing in certain communities and certain venues, there are certain methods that in that moment in time are the method that will help you publish in there. And it's funny because like in digital humanity, it was like this with topic modeling, like, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, and everyone was doing topic modeling. And then suddenly everyone switched to, to, to word embeddings and then to deep learning. So it's, there are some trends for sure. Um, I, I have a, a kind of a similar, but along different lines question for, for Sasha and also for Ricard and for others. And it's mostly about uh, projects that are very, very long in time and for many years and involving uh, people and researchers along their doctoral uh, research and postdoc and things like this. And so I was wondering, how do you keep together a team of people working for many years, especially if they are moving along their careers. Uh, for me, that was kind of an issue because I, I basically changed my topic between PhD and postdoc and now again, and I have all these si little side projects that are continuing, which are very hard to co continue to contribute. So I was wondering if you can share some like ideas or opinions. Thanks, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I, I, I kind of give a little hint in presentation about it, but uh, I think it is very important for, uh, for understanding of a project in a much lar larger scale. So I think that is kind of very important thing. Um, it's very important as well that uh, collaborators have the freedom for, for example, and also kind of um, patience. For example, like my background are former Yugoslavian languages because I'm born in Croatia, living in Serbia, then moved to Norway for research later there, but like a, a kind of languages, that are, but my collaborator was in German, French, English, and Russian. So basically, literally speaking, it took about uh, eight years to start working with languages of my own interest, now with the JNR, et cetera, like a Croatian, Serbian, Slovenian. Uh, so that is kind of very, very much important that you have, that you have, a, that you have a long-term vision and then you really share and uh, very respectful toward each other, other work that you have dynamic uh, that, that kind of gives, uh, how to say like a, you know, like a roadmap, you have a checkpoint that give you satisfaction for all of us. That is very much important. And then that we basically very much listen others, other needs because we are metaphorically and uh, as all as a family, you know, so we, we hear each other and uh, in our case, with uh, with Eugene and me, we are we are kind of formally family, <laughs> which which gives different different avenues of celebration here. <laughs> but and so, this sort of happened on the way, like we've been working together sometime before we got married. Yeah. So 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 this kind of gave a formal structure of your collaboration that is kind of more difficult to to break and more kind of incentives, but like a. The, a part of us with other colleagues, as I said, like uh, we really care to to understand what is their needs. 
So, so like just simply speaking for, for Lazar, which is very interesting, he really cares about the news, fake news, understanding big data analysis and trying to find truth and cross connecting. And that's how we work across the books, across, across books. We try to find uh, news, not news, but like a, a philosophical even background, etc. So basically yeah, in short or longer, that was the answer. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, I, I can add, um, when we presented um, our presentation, the, the, the last slide was with the recommendations and, and there was one uh, point that, that I didn't put there in the list, but, but should have been there. And, and that point is uh, get funding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and funding, uh, relatively uh, long time funding. Uh, so what we did, we have, a, we had a workshop where, where we invited uh, researchers, uh, humanities uh, researchers, uh, and uh, the workshop was about coming up with good project uh, ideas. Uh, and at this work, we, workshop, we, we, we had this idea for, for what we, the project we presented here today. And, and, and then we, we applied for funding and, and got funding for, for four years. And, and we um, and we, all, we had funding for for everyone in the project on on equal terms. So 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 uh, the the humanities researchers ha, ha, has has funding too. So so everyone can can uh, be a part of the project you know, on equal terms. And I think that's that's very important. On funding, this is a very important point, and. Uh, uh, Kind of a side question on funding uh, could be expanded to others. Uh, so I think it's it's essential to find long-term funding because for this type of project, you definitely need time. You need time for having people together, brainstorming ideas and discuss them. And it's something that you can't really do with a short-term grant because then you will focus on very, uh, you know, easy to reach uh, milestones, but not for the big and broad vision, basically. So I was wondering, many, like a few people mentioned the mixed method in the humanities grant. And, and it's funny because I remember that grant because it's the first one that I have ever applied. I, I didn't get it, uh, but, uh, but it's nice to see that like some projects reach the end and with like successful outcomes. So I was wondering in general, if other people could jump in and describe their own national environment, if there are grants that are supportive for this type of research, or if they are considering like what kind of grant they have in mind usually, if there, or if there's a lack of grant. In this. Uh, feel free, anyone that wants to join. I think uh, I would like to chime in, um, probably more related about your prior uh, question, um, you know, how to keep stuff going. And I guess it's related to the funding um, issue. So um, one thing I find extremely relevant is to, you know, is, is software uh, development and sustainable software and processes like annotation processes and metadata about how this works. Um, and I think there are like, you know, most funding schemes actually are, are contradicting this, right? Um, maintainable software is kind of like the opposite as software which helps you to experiment. Um, so um, kind of like joining these two aspects together is, is really difficult. I haven't really found a true solution. Um, but one thing that we did from the start was like try to establish, you know, Git as our means of choice of, you know, having, having a, a shared understanding, you know, um, and um, such aspects are, are difficult, um, difficult to work with um, and, and you need quite a technological background to get all that sorted out, uh, but it's super important. Now, as for funding, I think we have a range of projects that are extremely long running, mostly about data and about data storage, like all this Clarin and Deraya. Um, I don't know if, if that's actually also good about dealing with maintainable and sustainable research software. Um, but yeah, so, so there I actually do see a, a, an issue. I see the, I see the point about um, get long-term funding. I guess one of the ideas is, you know, 
um, as a professor, you're basically long-term funding, right? I'm not, unfortunately. Um, so I do see um, group leaders in a position that they can actually sustain the work of their group by actually having a view at the software um, and having an overview of the actual material. Um, and I think that's quite important as a rule to kind of, you know, be in a situation yourself to, to have good handovers when people leave, uh, to be yourself the person who actually knows and understands the notes from the handover to be able to explain these onwards and, and maybe in five years down the road. Uh, Daria, do you want to jump in? I have a very different question, but it hasn't been addressed in any of the talks, so I wanted to start with it. Um, when collaborating with uh, DH researchers or with historians, uh, literary scholars, and so on, I frequently come across uh, two very uh, difficult problems for NLP people to collaborate with. Uh, one is the fact that for example, historians, they're interested in maybe uh, diachronic research or research on data from very different periods for, for, for which uh, NLP tools perform with very different levels of quality. For some data, they are useful. For some data, it's better that you just don't use them because they just don't work on those. On the other hand, some researchers like historians or literary scholars, they are language agnostic. They want to research concepts in countries that no longer exist or in the same existing countries where uh, official languages uh, changed. Um, so even, you, even if you have NLP uh, tools to help with your local language where you, uh, are focusing all your efforts, you are completely lost uh, for all the other languages. So how does this imply on the collaboration dynamics and on the methodological choices down the line? Uh, please feel free to jump in, otherwise uh, I can also add something. Um, I mean, I, I really like your point on issues when, when uh, we use NLP method uh, outside of their, you know, safe environment where they work and they achieve state of the art performances. And it's, it's always, I mean, after a few years that you work in NLP, it's kind of funny because you know what we left them. Basically, you, you take these tools and then before anything else, you try them and, and then it's like, ah, okay, it works like this. Uh, and then you you basically set again your like you know your baseline now, and then you realize that from there you need to improve. Um, I think it's so honestly. I think this is a problem in, in rhetoric on the way that we present NLP methods when we are doing NLP research. Like they are the you know the best thing ever without being honest with ourselves and with the community in saying that these methods work perfectly in very controlled environment but they have lots of issues that we should be aware of when we move outside of our environment. So I think it's something that people learn after doing one collaboration, like after a while that you try this method outside and you realize the issue, there was a discussion before, even in, in ontology software so, or in tools, and there was a discussion about protege before. As soon as you use these tools and you realize that people will use them in, in our wider, range of applications uh, and not in your control setting there will be issues there so i think it's it's beneficial that people move outside their comfort zone uh, again but maybe this is a, a question more for people that are at their first experience in interdisciplinary research and they are maybe thinking if they want to continue along these lines or not uh, i mean doing interdisciplinary research is always like this it's always about realizing that the thing that you are developing need to be adapted to a different scenario, need to be adapted to different questions. So it's, uh, on that it's, it's challenging. And the only thing is giving values to these as real benchmark and not like, you know, as a small case study in an NLP paper, but like putting emphasis saying, now we are using our tools in a real case study where people really need these tools. Um, something like this but please jump in if you want 
I think the comments in chat are also valuable from the co-authors of the last paper for this, this discussion. I would like to ask a question. Can, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I just no. want to add, like, I mean, that, that is interesting, like, a regard, the, the question that Darius asked is interesting in a sense that basically you can think of two categories, you know, like, for example, the, the original research experiment that was kind of controlled <laughs> environment, basically, then you, you think of, you have to have a high high quality. And then after that, you, you kind of think, okay, so now how we can do it in a real world where, where, where there is a noise, but we still kind of have a additional added value. And in that case, basically, I think something that is kind of a X AI explainable AI is very important, where do you basically trace the roots of kind of reasoning, uh, which where human can trace and see, okay, this is coming from human that evaluated, or this is coming from human that kind of decided, or this is coming from AI without evaluation. So kind of this kind of classes, categories of, uh, of conclusions inside of your a data system, knowledge system is very kind of important to address this this noise in the real world. I would also like to say something yeah, about the um, um, many language aspect also that you raised, Daria. I think there, there is a little bit of a lack in evaluation. You usually, you usually use a uh, standard matrices and then what we measure is basically the uh, percentage of the data and we, we, we put it in relation to previous work, but we don't really, there is too little evaluation by human evaluators. So we can make, really pinpoint the problem and compare them to other yeah, studies. So I think this is where the, the main problem is. Super good point uh, on this, Dana. I think like, people, especially people in NLP usually don't even question that much the data sets and the benchmark that they are using. So maybe that's always a good starting point instead of taking an established benchmark, like looking who created this, are these real data or it's one of these, you know, artificially created benchmark and why people selected this. I mean, there, there are like acceptable reasons. Most of the time is data availability and good metadata on it, but it's good that people discuss about it and have a conversation around it. I think one aspect that is nice to bring together um, the evaluation in your certain subfield or on your kind of data um, and um, figuring out how well it works and so on um, is to look at well, active learning techniques um, the idea that you um, join or that you kind of like look and evaluate your data and then take those, you know, those looks at your data in, in a specified form and record them and then use that for further training. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you, you call it uh, active learning, human in the loop, whatever. Um, and I think uh, we found that to be critical. Uh, in, in we, we kind of had a late start on that much later than we wanted to because it comes in with an additional round of complexity of everything having to run offline uh, online without without human intervention or without a lot of human intervention um, but that is actually a critical part and and again um, like based on enough re research infrastructure that you can record uh, these human annotations or human judgments on, on system performance in a meaningful way um, and, and can trace back um, where errors occur um, in, in your computing pipeline and so on. Um, and, and, but that way you get actually a lot of additional value out of these additional kind of evaluations of the foundational technology and, and use that to adapt the foundational technology. Um, and that gives you a, a real benefit, but you have to think about that upfront and, and be able to integrate that in your workflows. Okay, thank you. I think that it's time for us to start wrapping up. I mean, I would have loved to continue, but I know that some people have to go to the next workshop. And of course, we have heard too much for me to be able to, to summarize everything. But I would like to mention that, um, that all these interesting talks and discussions um, had a few points in common, because there's one point that I heard in every single talk, I think, that was 
that in order to be able to collaborate, you have to develop a common language. You have to speak a, speak a common language. You have to develop a common vocabulary. And one of the questions, I'm not going to ask it now, but I, I would like to ask you to, to think about this. Um, how do you do that? Suppose that you have to teach computer science or data science students to collaborate with historians, and then you say, well, then you have to develop a common language. How, how do you do it? Are there any practical guidelines for people to arrive at a common language? I mean, do you put them in a room and lock the door and say you won't get any food before um, you have developed this language? Or um, are there tricks that you could use? Or, uh, so it might be an interesting topic for a next uh, workshop of this type to, to look at very practical things. Also, collaboration it was also a recurring word in many of the talks. Collaboration is extremely important. And, an interesting question is how and where do you find collaborators? Because I was impressed by, I think it was Sasha's talk where he had loads and loads of people who worked together. But if you're a lonely historian and uh, looking for a solution for your problem, where do you go to find such uh, clever people that can work with you? And that's also something. The pages. Collaborating dating pages. I'm kidding. Good. Yeah, well, actually, this was something that came up at the, the, the uh, previous uh, Twin Talks workshop, some sort of dating service. And I'm still thinking about this problem, this issue, see how we could do that. Because especially in, in, in the same community like the Clarion community and the Daria community, there are both lots of uh, computer scientists and data scientists who've got interesting things to offer and historians that are um, walking around and struggling with very interesting problems where they could really help each other. And what are the mechanisms uh, we've heard uh, uh, suggested for funding, if you get funding for joint projects? I mean, if you have money, it's always easy to find people. But if you don't have money, it might be harder. But of course, these are the things for, let's say, the, the agenda of the next uh, Twin Talks wor workshop. I would very much like to thank all of you uh, Federico for his very inspiring um, uh, initial talk and also for his very inspiring way to lead the discussion to bring up lots of interesting points that people would react to. I would like to um, thank all the, the participants, all the, the presenters, and I must say that I really enjoyed the, um, the workshop.